Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art, and today is April 10th, 2018. And as I mentioned in last week's video, we we're going to do a, a video this week about the auction results for three of the Sotheby sales that took place in Hong Kong um, uh, just last week. And they were the uh, important Chinese art, gems of the Spielman collection, and uh, a collection of imperial porcelain, a small collection, only about 10 lots. Uh, the results were okay, but um, something did happen, which was a little bit surprising. On average, the sales had about 30% of the items didn't sell, 30 36% in some cases. And in one case, uh, they had nearly a 50% unsold rate. And that was the, uh, um, let me see, make sure I get this right. That was the Spielman collection. Uh, 28 out of 63 of their lots didn't sell. Um, and I think that's largely just because they had uh, uh, rather ambitious um, estimates, which often happens when, when, when dealers and so forth sell their own stuff. They tend to get very aggressive on estimates. Um, and, and, and the fact that they've had them for a while, sometimes it makes them a little harder to sell. So at any rate, let's move along here. This is the first one we're going to take a look at, important Chinese art. Uh, we had a one, the, the cover lot on this uh, particular catalog was splendid, and we're going to talk about that a little. But first, we're going to start here. This was an extremely rare um, gold uh, Yongshen period uh, saucer dish, uh, not very large, only about seven inches in diameter. Um, gilding uh, or gold pieces uh, were, were rather rare. Uh, even in the Yongchen period, they were used, they were, they were made during the Kangxi period, and the use of gold first happened in the Yan dynasty and then a little bit more in the Ming, but it became very refined during the Yongchen period. And this plate did very well. It brought 2,250,000 Hong Kong. Uh, the exchange rates right now are about eight to one, so divide it by eight, it'll give you roughly an idea of what it, what it, uh, you know, what it was in uh, in U.S. dollars. All right, and if we blow it up, it's it's quite a piece. Uh, the the uh, quality of the glaze on this is just exceptional, and uh, gold, of course, is uh, an imperial color and uh, is tied to all kinds of symbolism. And so forth, but uh, notice the uh, the very nice white back on it. It was sold uh, by Bluets at one point in uh, London, and also the uh, foot on this is very creamy, uh, almost ivory toned, uh, beautifully done, and uh, it did just you know it did just great. It's a so two two point two million divided by eight is around. Uh, just a, a little under uh, three hundred thousand dollars U.S. Not bad. All right. And then on to this, this Daotsai cup. Um, this is an amazingly rare cup. There are not many of these known, only a handful. And uh, it was beautifully done. It's Kangxi period. Uh, the enamels on it are just exceptional. And it has a poem uh, taken from, a, a Tang, from the Tang dynasty um, regarding um, the life as a Buddhist, basically, or an immortal. And, uh, it was first uh, done in the Tang, and you see a lot of Tang influences on on Kangxi, Yongchen, and especially Qinlung uh, porcelains and uh, objects. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, fascination with that, and there were a great number of these examples uh, of, of early pieces and script in the palace collection. So they were they were uh, as assorted uh, kiln masters came along, they would they would look back at what was popular. Uh, a thousand years earlier and, and, and bring them back. And this particular cup was one of them. And they're on here, the, the catalog notes uh, break down the, uh, the, the, the poem and explain what it was about and the history of the poem and how it had appeared over, uh, uh, over history, including in the Song Dynasty and, and later on. All right? And it did very well. It brought 3.2 million Hong Kong, uh, or roughly $400,000. And then on to this. This was, I think, my one of my favorite vases. I, I, I think this vase is just unbelievable. I think it's probably the one of the, the best of its kind in the world, if not the best. Uh, an absolutely unbelievable chin lung uh, uh, vase. It, it measures around 21 inches tall, which makes it among the largest ever produced. And the quality of the decoration is just stupendous, uh, no matter how you look at it. The use of uh, the cobalt in the incredibly fine quality uh, 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 yellow, uh, which backgrounds it. And they used a clear uh, sort of turquoise glazes over these pieces to accentuate the colors and so forth. And this is a really great example. And it was, it was done uh, under the tutelage of, of probably of Tang Ying, 
who was the uh, kiln master of the imperial palace um, during the Qinlung era and the Yongshen area. He, he, he straddled both periods and was always looking for things um, through the, again, through the imperial archives uh, that would uh, uh, fascinate the emperor. And this certainly was one of them, uh, without a doubt. And uh, if you bring it over and you blow it up and you can see the quality of the work, the, the ferocious face of the dragon, the brows lifting up, and the very fine uh, application of heaping and piling effects, which were uh, very prevalent during the Ming Dynasty. Uh, and this was just a, a magnificent uh, vase. And I, I don't think it went for too much money. I'll be, you know, I, I know 70 million Hong Kong is a, is a lot of money. It's, it's, a, you know, it's about $8 million U.S. But for what this is, I don't think it was a, a, at all a crazy number. Um, this is, you know, like I said, I, I think one of the best of its kind in the world. They were done in just blue and white. But in yellow, it's just absolutely spectacular. And there's no way around it. Here's a look at the rain mark on it, beautifully done, framed in yellow, of course, and uh, so forth. All right. That was a, just a fabulous vase. And then on to this. This was a, a really, really fine uh, Chin Lung uh, red enamel ground vase, uh, beautifully done. It had been uh, at one point sold by Eskenazi years ago. And if you blow it up, uh, you can see the, the scraffito design uh, on the ground and these uh, very uh, Rococo-influenced uh, uh, devices all over it. And this was mostly due to the, the influence of Jesuits and so forth that brought designs to the imperial court, and the emperor enjoyed them very much. And uh, you ended up with uh, vases that looked like this. All right, and if you if you blow this one up, here's a here's a good a good look at the detail of this thing. Um, the enameling is just superb, all the way around. Uh, it's gently uh, shaded out from uh, in here. You can see it goes from green to to white, and uh, you see how they worked in the pink. Just unbelievably well decorated example, and it did very well. It 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 it, it did great. Here's, oh, here's a picture of the bottom. There's the bottom of it. Here's a picture of the the uh, the rain mark. Um, and uh, the Eskenazi label from a few years ago. This, I believe, is in Eskenazi's book, The Dealer's Hand. If you have a copy of it, I think you could find it in there and probably get more information on it. And this beautifully uh, done gold foot, the gold enamel foot, where you can see some of the uh, white porcelain pushing through um, from, from just wear. All right. And it did great. It brought 50 million Hong Kong. All right, so do the math on that. That's about uh, six, a little over six million, uh, six and a half million U.S. Six and a, six million two hundred fifty thousand. Just a great example, really pretty. And uh, onto this, this was my favorite bronze. In this, it is described as the property of a gentleman, and uh, is again uh, probably Chen Lung period. Very powerfully done, beautifully done with its original bronze base, and uh, it was enormous. It was 48 inches tall. All right, and it sold for 1.1 million, 1.18, 1 million, 1 million 187,000 Hong Kong or, um, you know, roughly, uh, you know, 120 or so thousand dollars. And I, I, again, it's a lot of money, but I don't think it's a crazy price. Uh, this is just a superb, elegant, uh, superbly elegant piece of uh, bronze work and uh, uh, just exceptional uh, and enormous, 48, you know, 48 inches, good Lord. And uh, on to this. this. This is, I think, without a doubt, the best jade that's turned up in, in, in a few years. Uh, incredibly uh, fine um, uh, Chin Lung marking period. It's marked with the Fanggu mark, which uh, meant that it did belong to the emperor. Uh, and again, of large piece. This was a monster. It was 16 inches tall um, and just incredibly well decorated, with, done in, with archaistic form, um, uh, which was a favorite of the emperor's. And if you blow it up, uh, you can see the really fine detail of the tortoises and the birds and the fish going around it and these beautifully, beautifully done, uh, finely worked uh, lines uh, of, you know, uh, mask handles with rings and this uh, braided rope base at the bottom and absolutely superb all the way around. Uh, here's, a, here's a detail of it. You can blow it up and really get in there. And you can see this very soft satin sheen that uh, from, on the, the patina that this thing has. Um, just a, an absolute uh, masterpiece as far as jades go. And uh, it, it did very well. It brought 21 million Hong Kong. 
But again, for what it is and for what some other jades bring, I don't think this was a crazy price. Notice here, you have these archaistic uh, uh, reliefs going around the neck and so forth. Um, just beautiful. Uh, in $21 million Hong Kong, it works out to you know under $3 million um, for maybe one of the best uh, Chin Lung jades uh, to be on the market in years, I think. Just, just a great example and enormous, 16 inches. And then on to the Spielman collection. This was a really interesting sale, and there were some very, very fine pieces in it. Uh, Spielman, of course, a, a dealer that has an enormous reputation for handling only the best. And uh, the, one of the lots that caught my eye was this. This is probably the only example of turquoise with overglazed red carved uh, with a chin lung mark um, in the form of a brush pot in the world. Uh, just an absolutely superb uh, example. And uh, on the other side is a poem. Um, with uh, this is called the Autumn Brush Pot. There's a poem on there about about the seasons. The same poem also, I believe, appears on month cups, especially in the Kung Shi period. It was a popular poem, uh, but the carving and the quality of the workmanship on here is unbelievable, and it was produced at the uh, Imperial Workshops in the in the uh, in the palace that was set up by uh, Chen Lung for um, carving and, and so forth, especially with Peking glass. And they did them at the Palace Atelier. And there is no other example uh, quite like this. There is a Kung Shi pot um, uh, that had been in the Bernat collection, is now at the Museum of Fine Arts, which is similar um, with red and so forth and, 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 and cut through, but uh, not of the quality of this. The quality of this was, is, is by far superior. And it brought $4.9 million. Again, a lot of money. But um, if you if you you know if you look at it into U.S. currency and for what it is, um, it, it it works out to about uh, uh, you know five five hundred eighty six hundred thousand dollars for a unique piece. Okay, there is not there isn't another one. This is just a great thing. And then on to this these really fine imperial lacquer bowls that were tea bowls that were made for the emperor. They were probably part of a large set, and on it they have um, uh, poems uh, uh, extolling the virtues of tea and the purity of it, and just uh, a beautifully done set. The, 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 the quality of the workmanship on these bowls with their silver liners and so forth is just incredible. Um, uh, it's hard to believe somebody did these by hand. Uh, just the, the best, the very, very best workmanship. And uh, they're both, of course, mark and period. We're going to maybe get a better view of it by blowing this one up. There you go. And uh, you can really see the depth of the carving, the, 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 the fine contrast, and uh, the proportions of the bowl are just perfect all the way around. And these are tea bowls. These are not large. They are uh, four inches in diameter. Here's a look at the marks, okay? Those, those are how they were carved in. And uh, they did very well, $1.8 million, or roughly, you know, 220000 or uh, 225000 or so, okay? Just, just great, 240000 I guess. And then on to this. This, this was fabulous. Um, this was a European subject matter um, uh, incense burner and cover. Um, and and uh, this was done in, in enamel, obviously, and it was probably produced in the in the, in, in uh, what is it in Guangzhou, I guess it was. Um, any rate, there's a whole uh, write up here uh, about the uh, the ori origins of the uh, enamel workshops that were started um, by Jesuit missionaries in Guangzhou in the 1680s, early in the sort of early in the Kangxi reign, and uh, their influence and 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 some of the great masters. Of, of the uh, 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 Guangzhou workshops were later brought and, and put to work. A couple of them were brought and put to work at the uh, Imperial Palace to make, to make examples there for the emperor. And uh, this is just a, an absolutely incredible piece. And uh, if you blow it up, you'll see uh, how, how adept they were at this enameling. And they were taught this, to do this by Jesuits. Uh, that were in the country. The, the influence of the Jesuits on the workshops and the art, uh, the, uh, the business of art in China, especially in the Kangxi and Chen Lung period, through the Chen Lung period, was enormous. And uh, they made a lot of contributions, especially with enameling. And uh, this is just a, a really fine example all the way around. And it did great. It brought $1.2 million, or a little over 100000 uh, you know, hundred and. Hundred and um, um, hundred, what is it? About one hundred and thirty thousand, I guess, something like that. And it also is marked on the bottom. All right, just a great piece. 
and then on to this. This this was a, a really fabulous Young Lo uh, uh, uh cloisonne piece. Um, extremely fine, uh, a very very rare type. Meant for a, a, it's a lotus uh, altar vase, and there's a good write up on this as well in the uh, in the piece. And uh, if you if you blow it up here and then and then enlarge it, and you get a good look at the enameling on here, and you see how bright the yellows were. Uh, those of you who remember a few years ago, the British Museum did a thing on Ming, on the Ming Dynasty, and on the cover of the catalog for that, they had a massive um, um, uh, Ming uh, um, uh, 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 jar from the same period. And again, you saw that same, the brilliant yellows, and uh, you have this beautiful deep green uh, here, and then and then switching over to yellow um, in this in the same in the same compartment, which is. Uh, uh, a really hard, was a really hard trick to pull off back then, and um, here's a view of the uh, the mouth. You can see that it's all gilded and so forth. Just a great example of, of Ming workmanship. They don't know exactly when it was done, but they know that it was done between the Yongle and the Shandi period. And uh, there is also again a great write up on it and how the Buddhists use them and so forth in, the, in their religious practices. And it brought 21,720,000 uh, Hong Kong. Or again, roughly, uh, you know, upwards very close to three million dollars U.S. And now on to the Imperial Porcelain Distinguished Private Collection. On the cover lot, there was obviously again we have another one of these big. This is a moon flask um, with a dragon on it, and we'll talk about that and a few other pieces. But we're going to start with this first. A really, really fine Yongshen period um, uh, celadon glazed bowl. They call these chrysanthemum bowls. There's a lot of symbolism in, uh, regarding the chrysanthemum and how many petals there are. And you can come over and read up on it. It's, it's a, a pretty good read, actually. And uh, this form and shape were originally uh, developed during the uh, uh, Song Dynasty. And um, uh, Tang Ying, again, the, the, the famous kiln master, um, had access to the imperial collections and the archives and would go back and look at earlier forms and shapes for inspiration for uh, production, and this was one of the pieces that he did. And this is just a, an absolutely extraordinary example because of the quality of the glaze and the quality of the potting all combining to make this just a, a really one of the great bowls uh, to come on the market uh, this season. And um, it did very well. It brought $1.2 million, and uh, it was, what size was it? It was uh, seven inches in diameter. Not not a terribly large bowl, not a small one, good size bowl. And here's another detail of the glaze. It's very important to look at the glazes on these things because it's something that they've not become very good at copying in these in the modern pieces. And uh, again, here's the the famous Yongshan mark, um, which was uh, always meticulously done uh, when it was produced in the uh, for the imperial family. All right, and then on to this this really rare blue and white. Dragon moon flask that ended up selling for now. This I thought this was a little funny. This is about a 10 inch moon flask and it's very attractive, um, and all that. It brought almost actually, it brought I think a little more than the yellow flask, the yellow uh, uh, vase did uh, earlier that was nearly twice as large and I think much prettier. But regardless, it, it, this did very, very well. And the moon flask, as you know, uh, first were first produced uh, uh, during the uh, um, uh, Ming Dynasty, really, and then uh, were revived and it went into a revival during the Yong Chen and then especially in the Chen Lung period, very popular. And uh, on them, when they did the dragons, they were again, you know, rather ferocious looking here with their with these sort of pinwheeled claws up high and. And the uh, and the and the face of the uh, dragon looking straight ahead, uh, very very interesting for the imperial court and the emperor loved them. And Tang Ying produced these to please him. And uh, there's a nice view here of the side of it. There it is. And again, there's also a very good write up on it and so forth. This 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 particular vase sold in Hong Kong uh, about 30 or so years ago in, in 1987. All right, and it did 22 million Hong Kong. Just a great piece. And then now on to this. This was uh, this beautiful quail and flower pattern uh, uh, vase in famille rose or, or feng kai enamels. Um, and and these, this pattern is particularly rare and unusual. Uh, the, 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 quail, the, quail, the quail decoration with flowers was first, uh, I believe, evolved during the Song Dynasty. And uh, wasn't often done on porcelain, especially during the Qin Lung period. 
but again, Tang Ying's uh, influence, I guess, uh, got them to uh, produce some more of these. And this is a pretty good sized vase. There's a, there's a good shot of the decoration. You can see how fine it is, especially these orange flowers and the shading up here is just uh, exceptional. Let's blow that up. There we go. There we go. Look at the, the quality of the decoration is beautifully outlined and then filled in. And the uh, use of Famille Rose pink it goes from very, very light, almost white, all the way to a very deep, fully saturated color. Just terrific. And uh, this vase was uh, 13 inches tall. It was a nice size. And uh, again, there's a great write-up on it down below. And it explains how the, oh, the bird and flower paintings can be traced back to the Five Dynasties period, which is 906 A.D. And um, it, it became uh, very popular during the Song. So it actually predated the Song. All right. And uh, then on to this. This was the Yan Dynasty uh, Lotus Pond Charger. It's a well-known pattern that was done during the period. This particular plate measured uh, 15 inches. Uh, it's a charger. It's a big boy. And uh, it brought 4.9 million uh, Hong Kong, or, you know, around uh, $600,000. Uh, a really great example. It did have some flaws in the center, all right? And though it seems trivial, it does impact price. And uh, has that, that very famous wave border that was developed during the Yan Dynasty. And then within the border of, of, of vines, um, and with, it looks like a pomegranate and so forth. And then, the, bur then, the, then the, the, the water plants coming up in the center. Just absolutely beautiful piece. And as I said, it brought 4.9 million. All right. And then lastly, we're going to look at this. This is the uh, Ming Yong Lo period plate that was done just slightly later than the, the, the piece we were just looking at. And uh, you can see the uh, changes in the refinements in blue and white uh, between then and uh, between the Yan and, and, and the uh, Ming, uh, and also a, more, a little bit more delicately painted. Uh, again, this barbed rim that you also see on uh, uh, Celadon chargers quite often. You see almost this exact form, as a matter of fact, on, on uh, Celadon chargers uh, fairly often. There was that great one that sold just a few weeks ago in New York for uh, around $600,000 or something. But at any rate, you have this, and this is a beautiful plate. Um, it's not terribly large. It's uh, 14 inches. It's a little bit smaller than the other one. Some of these can get quite big. They can get bigger, much bigger than this. And it sold for $5 million Hong Kong, or again, around uh, uh, $600,000 US. It's just a beautiful example. And uh, that's it. Uh, there were a lot of other great things in there. And if you, if, you, um, if you haven't had the time yet, come back and you can flip through these catalogs that we have on the site and you can do your own homework. Or you can go to the Sotheby site and go through their stuff. They, have, they actually have more of the catalog notes on the site than they put in, these, uh, in the catalogs. Um, they, they have them on the site itself. But uh, check it all out. And uh, that's it. And we'll, we'll be back um, um, in the future where, as other things come up. Uh, subscribe if you haven't so far and join us over on bitamount.com uh, at the forum and uh, get the weekly newsletter. And uh, thanks so much for watching. Alrighty, bye bye.